Good afternoon. Today we have uh, gone to Sarbit and we are talking to two beautiful young ladies and I'm going to let them introduce themselves right now. We will start with you. Thank you so much for having us on your show and thanks for coming to Hanulit. Uh, my name is Hai Manut. Um, I was born and raised in Desi and I moved to Addis 10 years ago to join college. And I studied business management and worked in a bank and um, in a school called Lebawi Academy for two years. Then I started Alamic Design and I started doing photography. And now I co-founded Hanubit with my good friend Nuno. Brilliant. And you? My name is Nuno Yilma. Um, I'm a textile artist. I'm also a mother. I left Ethiopia when I was nine years old during the Geishabur, during Dark. And I lived in Saudi Arabia for a bit and then relocated to California uh, permanently. And then after 37 years, I moved back to Addis. And I'm here now, uh, opened Hanuwit with my partner Jaime. We're really glad to be here. Beautiful. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. So for our audience, we have come to Hanuwit. This is the both Nunu's and Jaime's store. So we're going to go straight into the questions. Can you both tell us what you are passionate about? My passion has always been art. Um, uh, my sister is an artist, um, a really accomplished uh, oil painter artist. And from her, I've learned a lot in terms of art. I appreciate art. So even though my background in terms of education, I did not study art initially. I did a bachelor's in liberal studies, and then I did a master's in technology management, and then I moved into the corporate world and did HR consulting. So my education was really not art, but after being married and having kids and raising my kids, I went back to doing art and studied graphic design. So graphic design kind of led me to textile art, which has become my passion, and specifically batik, which is really well known in Africa, uh, especially West Africa, Southern Africa, and really not um, available here in Ethiopia at all. Uh, actual batik, which is done by hand, um, painted or patterns with, um, with stenciling and with wax. That kind of batik is really not being done in Ethiopia. So I wanted to explore that and also bring it to the art community here. Beautiful. Yeah. And you, Amy? I also didn't have an art background. I studied business management and growing up I uh, wanted to be a lawyer. That was actually my first choice when I was 12th grade and uh, taught that I could, you know, join one of the government universities. But my grade was not really good, so I had to move to Addis and join uh, a private college. And I decided to study business management. But I didn't actually think that I would own my own business and apply what I've learned in school. Uh, but when I was in college, I had friends that were in art, painters, photographers, and musicians. So spending time with them uh, actually inspired me to be interested in art. But I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. So I, you know, I explored a little bit. I started music, I started uh, painting, and I started photography, which I'm still doing. And then after that, I, yeah, Hamik Design was born. I just, I love creating stuff, so that's one thing that I'm passionate about. Could be in photography, could be in, you know, creating uh, clothing, creating a little piece of jewelry. So for me, what I'm passionate about is creating something new, something that's been in my head, in my imagination, and giving birth to that. Beautiful, well said. So, you both decided to change your line of work. Uh, from hearing both of you and learn skill, new skills on your own. How hard was that? Because you went to school, got educated, and then start, worked a little bit, and then decided that you wanted to get into the creative. Yeah. And in order to do that, you didn't go back to school. You both educated yourself, so yeah. you're self-taught. So I want to know, or you could describe to our audience, how hard or how easy that was. I mean, I would have to say for me, because graphic design teaches you the basic principles of design, um, it's visual communication. So I had a really good background on how to create designs. What I did was instead of doing it on the computer, I changed that from a digital medium to an actual fabric. So for me, it was really seamless. What was difficult was figuring how to do batik. 
And I actually started while I was in California. So in California, not many people are doing batik. Um, when I came here too, not many people were doing batik. So it took me about five years to really learn the technique, trial and error. And then I spent some time with a batik artist, a master artist from Thailand for three days. He gave me a three day kind of crash course. And that was it. I became really good at it. And I'm still learning. I mean, it's, it's a process. As I told you, I didn't have an art background. So I just, I learned so many things from the internet, from YouTube. And when I was in college, I used to make uh, jewelry for myself, for my friends. And I never thought that it would actually be something that I could do as, you know, a, a source of income. Yeah. yeah. It was very random. So after I quit my job, I quit my job because I didn't like it. The school that I was working at was, uh, it was really amazing. I loved my colleagues, I loved the school, the students, but what I was working was not really making me happy, so mm -hmm. I decided to quit even without having a second plan or um, a clear idea of what to do after that. So I was just staying at home, you know, experimenting with things, and one time I just uh, happened to be in this gallery called Dink, it doesn't exist anymore. I went there with a friend of mine to uh, visit an art exhibition, and they had a concept store. So I went there and one of the owners was, uh, she was there, she happened to be there and she saw what I was wearing and she asked me, who made your jewelry? And I said, I made it. And she was like, if you want to sell your stuff, you can bring them and you know, uh, see if that works. And I was not convinced at first. I, was, uh, I wasn't sure that people would actually you know, spend their money and buy my products. And um, a friend of mine, convincing me to do that and I spent two weeks that used you know whatever I got uh, fabrics that a friend of mine gave me uh, earring hoops that I got from a friend as well and I created some uh, beautiful jewelries and necklaces and notebooks and I went back to the gallery and I signed a contract consignment contract then I had to go back home and wait for one more month to see you know if how it went yeah <laughs> if it was something that that was good um, then I went back after a month and half of the staff was oh, so gone. Yeah. Brilliant. So that was a turning point <laughs> for me. After that, I just, you know, couldn't stop. I kept experimenting, exploring, and, you know, watch a lot of videos, learn from my fellow designers, read books. Yeah. It's a process. I'm learning from the process. I know. And I guess you keep learning. Yes. You keep learning. Yes. Hi, Miguel. How did you come up with hammock design and when did you start it? It was 2016, I guess. Uh, but that was the process. At first I didn't have a name, as I told you, after I put my stuff in the gallery. Um, one of the owners were actually very, she was a very good uh, woman. She gave me really good advices how to you know, improve the quality of my products, uh, where to go to save my stuff, you know, list of bazaars that I could participate to. Then uh, after a couple of months, I participated in, in, in a bazaar at Alliance Steel Francis. Then I um, participated at Ambar and Artisan Bazaars, you know, those big bazaars. That's so all that time you had hammock design or you didn't yes, have a name? Since you the, had? Yeah, okay, I mean, okay, hammock okay. design uh, was my nickname. It's ah. my nickname, but it was, it's only okay. my cousin who called me Oh, that's hammock. beautiful. That's <laughs> so beautiful. I, I actually tried to get a a better name, but I just couldn't come up with anything. So I was like, no, why not Hamic? Uh, so yeah, I just named it Hamic Design. And then yeah, it just goes from there. No, no. Why was your batik initially met with confusion here? I think it was because um, I, you know, when I decided to do batik here as a textile artist, one of the things that was really exciting for me was I could use traditional fabrics. And what drew me to textile art when I came to Ethiopia and started living here was all these gorgeous fabrics that you just see, you know, uh, in traditional shops, shiromeda, people wearing them. So um, what I'm wearing now is a linen, hand-woven linen um, fabric that's hand-woven here in Ethiopia. And when I saw these fabrics, I just thought, we have to have color because a lot of our traditional fabrics are white. So when I started painting these using the batik technique and people would look at it, they would say, well, that's not traditional. And I said, no, it is. It is absolutely traditional because I would tell them what the fabric is, like what you're wearing is Saba, which is a cotton and rayon blend. But Saba is very popular in Ethiopia for traditional um, dresses. But what I've done is painted it 
using the batik technique and now it's something different. So people had a hard time understanding that this was Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, it is Ethiopian. What it is is Ethiopian batik. Uh, and that's how the brand Ethiopian batik was born. Was born. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> that's beautiful. What motivated you both to create such unique products? I always try to see what's missing uh, and come up with an idea to fill the gap. So when I started, for example, when I started making the chokers, the tele chokers, it's because I couldn't find anything similar, anything mm -hmm. like that for myself to buy and wear it. Mm -hmm. So I had to bring create that it. idea <laughs> to life and create that piece. Um, so what motivates me is, you know, just go around and see what's missing and, um, yeah, fill that gap. I think for me it was um, looking at the amount of knowledge and craftsmanship and artisanal products that are in Ethiopia. And they're so beautifully made and there's so much talent here. It, it really surprises me how much people make. But I thought, okay, well, I can make something like that, but I also want to do something contemporary and be able to compete at the global level, internationally. How can these fabrics that we wear as Agar Lipsis, Net Ala, uh, Menon fabrics, Wildeyes fabrics, Fatal, Argabis, how can we take that to the global level and still compete at the international level? So for me, that was the biggest motivation. And creating Hanubit, I think that's what motivated both Heine and I. Yeah, it's very challenging. So challenge always, you know, makes you grow. Absolutely. So we challenge yeah. ourselves all the time <laughs> to come up with new ideas. And to exactly, it makes you strive. How did you guys meet? And how was Hanubet born? <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually met at my husband's school, which she mentioned earlier. Um, it used to be called International Leadership Academy of Ethiopia when it first started as an NGO. Now everybody knows it as Labawi Academy, but I started um, a special education program there because I have a daughter with special needs. So part of my life is a textile artist. The other half, I'm also an advocate for people with special needs is something that's very um, important to me. So as I was building the program at Labawi Academy, Heine was um, hired as an admin assistant in the office and we kept on coming together and talking about art. I actually created a piece of her in one of my textile arts that I gave to her, yeah. So we just kept on talking about art and that's kind of how we met. And, and she used to come, before she started her um, uh, Ethiopian batik, she used to come to my bazaar to support me and, you know, to see, to learn yes. from the, what she sees in the crowd. That was six years ago? About we six years about ago, six yes. Six years ago. But Hanubit was born a year ago. So we've been Today for is it. actually a day we're supposed to be celebrating, if I'm yes. not mistaken. So what is today? Uh, so today, last year, to, uh, this day, uh, we had our first fashion show. That was before we opened Hanbei. What did you gain out of the fashion show? As, as we always wanted to, you know, work together to collaborate. But since 2020, I think, that's when we started to be more close to each other, to spend a lot of time together and talk about opening a store, you know, collaborating. Uh, and doing that fashion show made us realize that we could actually be partners. We could, you know, put all our stuff in one store and it could still work. Um, yeah. It that, us an idea. That experience, um, the opportunity that we got when we worked with Store 251. Store 251 has, we used to be at Jupiter International. They're now um, in another location. But they had a philosophy of holding, of showcasing Ethiopian made fashion, accessories, high, uh, high, quality. high quality, yeah. So they asked both of us to come in to their store and host a pop-up. And we said, great, let's do a pop-up, but how about we do a fashion show to really complement the pop-up so people can see our clothing on models. So that's when we created this yeah. joint venture. It's not a really proper fashion show, the kind of fashion show that people would think about, or you. It was a pop-up. It was a pop-up. <laughs> pop the but, fashion you know, show we, was a... Yeah, we invited all our fans to model for us, you know, real people, with different size, colors. It was really beautiful. That must have very, been very nice. Yes, it was a very beautiful Because they're different experience. sized people, yes. they're humans as opposed yes. to model stick yes. figures. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. That's what we wanted to do. That's actually what we want to do. We still do that, yes, with our models. We use our friends, people that love wearing our clothes because we feel like our customer has to be the real person. We don't exactly. always want to use 
beautiful models. I mean, we will use beautiful models because they are beautiful and they wear clothes beautifully, but it's also nice to show an actual person who, who enjoys our clothing. So it was a milestone for us, that fashion show. <laughs> And now we're set everything. Nice. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your one year anniversary. Thank you. What do you think of the creative industry in Ethiopia? It's changing. <laughs> I know, right? To something. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, we were talking about this last night, and uh, one thing that we realized is that, you know, things were better 40, 50 years ago in all aspects, you know, in fashion, literature, music, but from then, you know, things have been going really down. <laughs> but now, you know, there are really talented young people who are trying to get back to our roof and create something beautiful, including us, actually. That's what we're trying to do, you know, go, going back to the roof, use the traditional methods that our fathers and mothers have been, used, have been using for a long time, and giving, trying to put that into the map, to the international market, by making it contemporary and urban. Designs. So it's growing, it's changing. Thank God. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, because I've lived um, elsewhere, mostly in the West, in America and California, and I, I don't want to say this in a critical way, but sometimes countries in the West, to me, are more monochromatic. Kind of everybody's wearing the same thing, everybody's kind of doing the same thing, everybody's behaving the same way. For me, coming to Ethiopia, there is a variety right. of really everything here. People, everybody dresses differently. differently. Everybody has their own style and they're very comfortable in that style. So I really appreciate that. So I think there's a lot of creativity here. Is there infrastructure within the country to promote the creativity? I think that's something that can be worked on. But I also think the younger generation, like Jaime's generation and the ones that are younger, are creating amazing forms for creativity. You know, restaurants doing pop-ups, music, art, the sip and paint mm. is such a great environment where you're able to drink with your friends and paint and you'll have a piece of work, you know, at the end. Your work, you know, this, what Arts TV is doing, giving us this platform to talk about our work. Mm -hmm. I think there's some good stuff happening in terms of the creative industry. Don't you think? Absolutely. <laughs> I, would, yeah. my, I was going to ask, in what way do you think that we can make this creative industry much better because like you said there's a lot of young talented uh, people out there and for any of them that is actually watching it who's new how do you think they should either you know approach what it is that they like or even approach the textile industry to you know to communicate and see you know what can we do to make it better yeah because one of the things that i've noticed is because I know you work in natural products and like you, you can you work on synthetics I can't work on synthetics exactly right my dyes are specifically for natural fibers. natural and natural, cotton yeah. silk nin, linen yeah so my next question would be how is it actually you also use that so how easy is it to get Material. these exactly these uh, fabrics natural fabrics because I hear now that we can't even get a hundred percent natural t-shirts because mm -hmm. they're uh, putting yeah. them together with synthetic. I mean, for me, my focus is on traditional fabrics. I'm using shamanyuch weavers that are uh, weaving the fabric by hand. So I don't know if you know this, but Ethiopia has Addis Ababa, like, uh, specifically Addis Ababa, not even Ethiopia. The number is bigger if we looked at Ethiopia, but Addis Ababa has 500,000 shamanis. So we have you know, half a million people that are doing this work. So that means this is also part of our culture, it's part of our history. 2,000 years, 3,000 years of doing shimana, we are the experts in this, in this craft. So for me, it's not, it's not difficult to get it. I have actually you access. You go straight to the source. I go straight to the yeah. shamanis. I mean, I have like three, four different uh, organizations that I go to to source my fabrics. Beautiful. But their work, I think, sometimes is um, challenging because their resources are not readily available. There is no infrastructure that supports them so they can get the, the right kind of threads, even um, the right kind of working conditions, the right kind of equipment. So their work is really challenging. But even as it is, they still produce you know, beautiful, beautiful fabric. So they would need, again, I think government has to come in and create some kind of an infrastructure, like 
an industry park. Yeah. So we were talking for shamanis. Okay, so the industry park does not include the shamanis? No. no. Ah. The industry parks are only machine made um, fabrics. So they have these huge machines oh. that are weaving beautiful fabrics and they're using beautiful cotton that is made in Ethiopia, but, that, but that's sent outside. It's for it's for exporting. It's not something that stays within the country. Yeah. What we would love to see is a creative park or you know an industry, industry park, park. Yeah. For our weavers to you know to come together for the people who does dying, for them to come together. So it would be, it would be easy for us to access so them. Actually, get, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we can actually just go to one place and finish exactly. everything finish from everything. Uh, yeah getting yeah. the cotton, weaving, hand span uh, includes hand spanning, then. You know, finding your tailor and open a market for our buyers to come to one place and you know access all our stuff. How do you think our government should utilize local resources to the benefit of the Ethiopian people? Do you think utilizing local resources should be a primary concern for the Ethiopian government? Absolutely, I think it should be. Um, they can start by, you know, shortening the supply chain, mm -hmm. um, you know, giving access to the local artisans to be able to find us, you know, the designers that are living in this city or even outside of Ethiopia. Because, for example, us, me and Nunu has to uh, go to all the way to Arwamenj or Ar Bahardar to find, uh, to work with our weavers. Uh, we've tried to work with weavers that are uh, here in Addis, but it just didn't work out for some reason. It could be personal reason or uh, some other reasons. But for us to go all the way to Arbam and just to get the fabric, it just it doesn't make sense because mm -hmm. we cannot do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do that once a year, but we need mm -hmm. to be more. Um, we need to be able to get more fabrics from them, but you know, just finishing everything by phone just doesn't work all the time. So for me, uh, one thing that we've mentioned earlier, you know, just try to put everything in one place. All these artisans, all this creative, all these designers could create a big um, income even for the government. Absolutely. And, you know, we could work on trying to get into the international market if things are easy for us. But now we cannot even supply enough for the local market because there are these limitations for us. And also even when we try to sell our stuff internationally, there are so many issues that need to be you know, addressed. addressed. Uh, yeah, the payment system, the shipping system, it's something that needs to be fixed for us to, in order to get into you know, the international market. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, there's, so there's twofold, which is what you're saying, there's a local and then there's the African, um, all our neighbors, exactly. Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, you know, Senegal. I would love to get fabric from Senegal. Do we even have access to that market? So, to answer your question first about the local access to local, uh, is it available for locals? It should be available for locals. But what has happened is, I think, a lot of cheaper stuff is here on the market. You know, mm -hmm. it comes from different places. It might come from Europe. It might come from the States. It might come from Asia. But there's, there's a lot of stuff that's a lot cheaper. And my stuff, what I'm wearing now, is completely Ethiopian made. This is linen, hand woven. This is Yabahardar um, Shamanyoch, weavers made this fabric. So this is 100% Ethiopian. Yep. But for somebody locally to have access to this, it's a bit expensive because it's made in sw small quantities. It's not made in large quantities. It's not readily available. Mm. It's certain little cottage industries. So I don't want to always say the government has to do this, but if we had an infrastructure that allowed this product to be made in large amounts, not in these small amounts, then it could be readily available for everybody. And then everybody can start wearing local things more often and we than can wearing. Start cheap prices. Yeah, and our prices would go down would get, too. Would go cheaper, yeah. yeah. So but because the, that's the main reason that people would, you know, uh, not buy our stuff. That's the most reason we get a lot. It's because you're expensive. It's because you, you're not affordable. That's why we're not wearing, you know, locally made products. Mm -hmm. But if you know, things were easy for us, we, you know, there's no, we don't have any reason to lower our prices and make it affordable. Yeah. The, and then the other part is in terms of Africa, we want to source fabrics from other African countries. We want Bogolon from Mali, Kitange from, from Tanzania. 
Um, there's so much out there that we want to be able going to, to come up with that. I was going to come to that because now that we have the free trade, how can all these amazing designers be a part of this free trade? Because I had a conversation with uh, actually Hortons and we were talking about these fabrics being, and one of the things she, she mentioned was there's going to be a one tender where it's not really one tender, but you buy an Ethiopian if you're buying from Kenya, but there's one entity that the exchange is going to happen. So you buy with Ethiopian, you don't have to buy from Kenya in shilling. Mm. You know, you, you, you pay in bur, but they get their money shilling. in shilling. In shillings, okay. So I think that's the best way yes. that we can buy from each other. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to be very hard. It's very hard. I think for us, what has been difficult is we would have to take our bur transfer it to shilling or dollars and then dollars first and dollars then yeah and then purchase the items and then bring it back again transfer switch our money back to dollars and then bring our stuff here that is really cumbersome and it's it just doesn't allow for cohesive working um, conditions um, and then there's people i'm sure in kenya or or Senegal or Nigeria or Ghana who want the Netala fabrics, exactly. who want this just, fabric, the yeah. Saba, and they're not able to get it because there is no way for us to trade. Yeah. If that's something that improves, and Jaime and I really want to work on that because we think that's um, an important aspect of Hanubet because this is a Pan-African store. This is not specifically just Ethiopian, but we really want to push the Pan-African um, you know, concept at our store. So. That's we one also of the want to take our you know finished products to Kenya and you know have a pop up there and bring some other designers from to, Kenya yeah, and do the same from Kenya or Senegal from all and have a pop up for them. But in order for that to work, this system has to be easier. Yeah, be better. Absolutely. So now we come to handle it. Our favorite place. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, and I think we should start with the beautiful suit that you have on. This, um, we're currently working on a new collection. We're not going to talk about that. But this is just a trial. So, so a trial um, wearing this. In a suit and pants, or the whole concept, the whole the look whole is concept. new? We're working on colors and patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of months ago, we went to Arbanich and we sat down with our weaver for the first time, actually. We've, we've met him and had this several times, but usually it's you know, just our... But we sat down with our weavers and we talked about different fabrics, you know, the kind of dyes they use, the colors, the color options they have. And I just wanted to try something new, so you know, we just decided to create this fabric, including the tickets um, here on the pants and this. And I just got it soon, a couple of days ago, just for the <laughs> show. <laughs> it looks absolutely but it's, Yeah, it's all locally made. Um, yeah, yeah, because really at cool. first glance, unless you know our toilet, which is mm -hmm. on your collar and on the bottom of your pants, you can't really tell that it's Ethiopian fabric. Yeah, and I also didn't That's want to like look at, it, you know, yeah. the very traditional toilet, uh, because you can find that everywhere. Mm -hmm, I just no, wanted to look very a little more contemporary. So, yeah. It's your first show. I know. It's my first time wearing this on your show. Yeah, beautiful. I'm honored. So how do you guys come up with your designs? How do you come up with, especially when you do your batik art, mm -hmm. how do you come up with that specific art? Like what I have on, how did yeah. you come up with it? Or do you just get into it as your actually working with your colors? Because I've seen some of your color combinations are absolutely to die for thank you thank you know you. and you have to have that eye to be able to know what color goes with what i think my batik is a little different and it goes back to kind of the way i trained myself i didn't really train with a proper batik method which is a lot of it is patterns so what you see on a lot of um, african fabrics like kitange is like that it has a lot of patterns I'm more interested in actually painting on the fabric. So once you wear it, or what I'm wearing, it's actually a piece of art. So I look at it more as a canvas, and then it's an art piece. Thing. Yeah, it's an art piece. Uh, if we're going to build a collection together, then we'll work on, on color themes mm -hmm. and decide, okay, if this is the color that we're going to use, kind of this and this will be probably a collection because the color themes are kind of similar. Yeah. 
That's very interesting. Now, I've read somewhere that you somehow try to put in Ethiopian symbols and marks to, you know, to kind of give it that Ethiopian batik look. Yeah, I mean, the Ethiopian motif for me in terms of art is is something that really motivates me. It's beautiful, but I'm also really motivated by African motives because I have that pan-African background, I think, um, the kind of the way I was raised. I studied black studies too. I studied African history, so I'm really drawn to African art. So a lot of my patterns or my designs will look very African at times. Does that answer your question? She's yeah, a very She's a very... Yeah. She is. I like the fact that you said that this is your, your, it's your canvas. It is my canvas, yes. And then you paint on it, yes. and then you yeah. imagine yeah. what you should make out of that piece. Yeah. And each piece is unique. I don't mm -hmm. ever make the same you can. piece twice. So some people will come and say, can you make this again? And I'll say, I really, this, this is a unique yeah. piece. I'll make another piece for you, but that's going to be unique too, just exactly. for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so. you can never have the photocopy of the same Yeah, yeah. I, I like can, I, can I say something about Hanubit though? I think what Absolutely. motivated us to really, yeah, yeah, yeah. to open this up. Like I said before, you know, there's all this beautiful traditional fabric. There's all this craftsmanship in terms of the tailors, like, the tailor that created this, I mean, he has beautiful craftsmanship mm -hmm. because it's so tailored and beautifully mm -hmm. made. It can compete anywhere. You know, if she goes to France, London, the US. So when we looked at the amount of craft craftsmanship that's in Ethiopia, the tailors, the shamanis, uh, leather workers, because we, we also make bags, some of our bags. So when we looked at that, we said, we should really create contemporary things, things that will look Ethiopian, but would also look different on the international uh, market and make that available. Um, and then the other side too is we also question, I think Jaime and I question what is Ethiopian? Is Ethiopian just Natala and Talat? Or is Ethiopian a lot of different things? You know, so we go to Konso and we get the Konso ribbons mm -hmm. because that you usually don't see very much of, but yeah, we Ethiopia use that. Ethiopia is not being re represented. Exactly. Like, Ethiopia is not just, you know, so it, white fabric. And yes. No, it's not. It's just yes. that it represents a certain for people, but yeah, Ethiopia has to yeah. We're very offer rich. More than that. Yeah. Very rich. The and then you guys also go beyond Ethiopia, yeah. which is even that much yeah. richer. Yeah. The Arbam and um, Shamanis that we're working with now that made this beautiful fabric, they're working on a Dunguza design, and the Dunguza design is a southern design, but you only see it in the south. But when I look at it through my graphic design eyes, it's a beautiful concept. So I can do a lot with Dunguza design. So we want to also really represent other types of designs that are out there that are not really being showcased mm -hmm. um, here right now. And then we have Maasai fabrics too yeah. that Jaime yeah. uses from Kenya. And this fabric that yeah. is sourced from different African yeah. countries. But we also want to promote their works. I mean, exactly. We don't really think that they're... It's, Nobody it's knows them. Fair. Yeah, Nobody them. knows them. Yeah, they are really creative, they're really talented, they're amazing, but you know, when you go to a store and buy a certain uh, piece of clothes, nobody tells you who made that. No, of course not. You don't not. know <laughs> yeah, the background of that fabric. Uh, so that's actually one thing we're trying to change as well, because every time uh, someone comes to our store and asks questions about our weavers, our uh, you know, tailors, we we give answers for them. We want them to know about our, the whole, you know, the whole process. Our yeah. people behind... Uh, behind your beautiful work. Yes. Yeah, because there's always somebody behind us. Yes. We're blessed, Jamal. We have yeah, you're absolutely blessed. Because you have very good... Uh, and I guess it's also because of your eyes. Mm. You guys like quality. So what you want to give is quality. Yes. Because one thing I've noticed uh, in our country is we have absolutely amazing things, but when it comes to finishing, we're not there. And we produce so much clothing, yeah. shoes, yeah. bags, that to not have such a beautiful product finished well kind of brings the whole thing down. Mm. So I just want to congratulate you. Thank you. On a work beautifully done because Thanks your so finishing, much. your work, your everything is amazing. We appreciate you, Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you. So, now that we've finished, of, finished where we buy our products, since you dye, I want to ask you about your dye. Yes. Where do you get your dye? Do you make your own dye? Is it natural? Is it chemical? 
because that's another issue that we have in this country is when we die, we've started dying. Yes. Our yes. Abisha lips. But then it usually fades. The first time you wash it, it's out. Yes. So I want to know how, what your technique is and what kind of dyes you use. I actually don't use natural dyes. I use reactive dyes, but they're very low in toxicity and um, they look very beautiful. I mean, they have very bright colors. Um, as long as you use reactive dyes in small quantities, it's very minimal in terms of environmental damage. I mean, very, very, very little. Um, natural dyes, a lot of people think because the word natural is there that the natural dye doesn't have chemicals, but natural mm -hmm. dyes actually have chemicals. So those dyes um, are not as vibrant as I like them because natural dyes tend to be a little pastel-y and because of the colors that Jaime and I are really drawn to, we really want bright, bold <laughs> colors like exactly. what you're wearing, I'm wearing. I tend to use uh, reactive dyes, but I'm very conscious about you know environmental, uh, making it sustainable. I work around my kids. My studio uh, is where my kids hang out too, so I'm very careful in terms of what exposure that they have, and it's very, very minimal. So where do you get your dyes? I, I get them. No, I get them from California. I have to have them shipped. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you know, eventually, when we uh, when we go when we uh, scale up this production. I will have to f source from somewhere else. I can't really go to California mm -hmm. to always get my dyes. But that will be some another uh, When we went to Arbanca bump, to, yeah. uh, to meet our weavers, they were telling us about you know, the new experiments they were doing using leaves and roots, plant roots, uh, to get natural dyes. Can you talk about that? Because you understand that. Yeah, I mean, natural dyes are, are beautiful. And Freo Konjo, who is a shamani in Arbamanj and is known, well known as uh, one of the best shamanis right now in Addis Ababa, is doing amazing work using natural dyes. Mm -hmm. And he learned that technique from Sabahar, which was the first organization. And I know Kathy very well. She supported my work. It's a little bit more involved because you create, you know, you might take like avocado seeds and then boil them for hours and then you'll get that color. And then to make that color stick on the fabric, that's when the chemical comes. Has to come in. Has to come in, yeah. Uh, he does a phenomenal job. It's a little bit more labor intensive for somebody that, like me who has a small studio. Um, I have a couple of assistants. I have, you know, I work on small production. That's important to me because quality is important. Like you said, you know, earlier, a lot of the stuff that's out on the market right now, out on the streets, mm -hmm. we wear the agar lips that has maybe a beautiful purple color once, we wash it and it's gone because they're not going through the process of making sure that dye is sticking to the fabric. It's one thing to dye fabric, to, but to make it stick and make sure that that dye does not come out when you're washing it is another process that you have to go through. And it's a long process. Mm. So some people are probably cutting those steps out exactly. because they want to make mm. you know, quick money, but that's not what I'm interested in. Mm. I, will al I think I'll always stick to smaller Productions because quality and consistency is really important to me. This way is very sustainable. You know? Those people, they're not gonna stay in the business for a long time because once you buy their products, nah, if it's away, you're not gonna go back to them. It's, yeah, exactly. So what you're doing but, I, but I'm also interested in having classes in my studio so I can, I mean, some of these people, there's small techniques that you can do to help for the, for the fabric to stay vibrant even when you're washing it. Then, so I would love to teach these kinds of techniques too, and I've actually taught somebody before, Magdas, and I taught her. So, okay. Yeah. Have you ever thought of? I, I know the Malians and I think the Senegalese use natural products, especially when they do their bogolon. Mm. Mm. You know, and some of the colors on the bogolon are actually pretty deep. They're gorgeous. So that might be once our fair trade. Comes yeah, in. Yes. I think travel. we're going to have to go around and find all these people and yeah, absolutely. I mean, they should come here and work with us. Absolutely. So we understand their techniques absolutely. and processes, and I think it would be wonder wonderful to even send our shamanis and our dyers from here, send them to these different areas and have this kind of collaborative work environment. So Hanubit, you started. You opened the door. You got the key and opened the door on what date? We got the store in May, yes. uh, but we spent a month to furnish it and to uh, process, you know, the legal licensing and all that thing. Okay. And we opened our store on June 19th. 
Almost a year? Almost a year. Our annual little celebration is coming up. It's coming up. It's coming up in June, yeah. Our brilliant friend Gonjit Seyum named our store Handmade. We actually, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what, you know, we should name name our store. Uh, We thought of a bunch of names, but none of them were really, you know, convincing. Uh, We're not happy with them. But Gonjit just came one day and she's like, why are you going so far? Just name it. Your, put your names together and name uh, name it after that. So it's Jaime and Nunu and it's Hanu. Hanu. And it came out to yeah. Hanu. Yeah. And we added Bates because of what? Talk. I mean, we yeah, we Bates was really important for us. And even the Amaringa, you know, the fact that there is this is Amharic name, Amaringa, is really important to us because that's what we represent, really. That's our foundation. And then we're building from that you know, to the Pan-African concept. So bait for us is we wanted this to be a place where people can come, share ideas, um, collaborate with us in terms of the work that we do, and also be able to showcase other people's work that we think is really important. So we're doing, we have Dichas right now. Uh, Freo Konjo, we have his Gabis. So we want to showcase other people's work too. And so we, we said we had a pop-up for self-care. We had all these beautiful artists and all um, essential oils, hair care products, skin care, all made in Ethiopia and just quality products. So we want this to be kind of a hub for people to come and showcase their work too, not just us. us, not us just yeah. us. And that's where the bait <laughs> comes in, yeah. Brilliant. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you to you for inviting us to the show again. And I want to say thank you to my business partner, Nuno, and all our friends, all our supporters, all our customers. We appreciate you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, this is a great opportunity for us to, to showcase our work. It's a great platform. Uh, just appreciate your work and your support. Thank you very much. Arts TV and Africa, thank you for having us here at Hanovate today. I hope everybody will tune in to see us on Saturday at 4 o'clock. I thank you again. Thank you.